There was a heat wave in Texas, quite a serious one. And there were questions around asking people to conserve energy. Uh, we've all been looking at ERCOT thinking, yeah, this is a great case study for Bitcoin, integrating Bitcoin in the grid. How did it stand up? Because I'm assuming you've paid close attention to it. Yeah. So, so what's been really fascinating to see is that about a gigawatt of capacity was given back to the ERCOT grid during much of this time. What does that mean in real numbers? 1% of that grid. Okay. Which is enormous, right? So if you, you know, the, the energy system can, can, you know, of base load doesn't change. So to be able to see 1% of the total energy system, which is probably two to 3% of the ERCOT base load, um, curtail is, is really, um, is really like pretty impressive. How many machines would that be about if they were S19s? Uh, it would be uh, 300,000. 300,000. Wow. Holy sh So there's that many machines plugged in? To yeah, there's probably about 300,000 machines wow. plugged in. That's insane. Um, across those sites. Before, yeah. before mining, what would have done that? What would have been that demand response? It's Blackout. Like, it's like an entire nuclear reactor. Like a nuclear reactor is somewhere between 800 and 1200 megawatts typically. And so anyone who's not listened to the previous shows we've done on this, just trying to explain to them what this actually means, what these machines are doing. They're increase, they, they're allowing for an increase in the base load. Yeah. So, so the way that, um, energy systems work is that there's, there's like on, on, on the supply side and the demand side, there's like two major behaviors. There's fixed generation, base load generation, and there's base load offtake con consumption. And then there's variable generation and variable consumption. So, for instance, um, base load cons uh, generation would be like a nuclear plant or a lot of the coal or nat gas plants that are out there, um, not wind or solar because those have intraday peaks and valleys. Um, similarly, on the consumption side, you know, your the lights in your house or your HVAC depending on the season, you know, the, the, the things that run low, you know, consistently in the background, that's your base consumption. Variable consumption would be like your dryer. I always remember there being like an anecdote in England that uh, at the interval for Coronation Street, it would go up loads because everyone would put the kettle on. Yeah, like a cup of tea. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I think that's a northern problem, right? Yeah, probably. We don't watch Coronation Street. We watch EastEnders. EastEnders, yeah. But that's on the BBC, but you don't have adverts. Uh, I'm more a keeping up appearances guy. <laughs> but Mrs. Bouquet. Of course, Mrs. Bucket. <laughs> I can't believe you know who that is. <laughs> the fuck do you know who that is? My parents raised me right. Oh man! So did you get uh, only Fools and horses? No, oh. uh, I I watched them. I watched Faulty Towers. Yes, Faulty Towers. Um, Black Adder. Oh my god, you got some good TV. I have great parents. That's why you get my humor. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so one percent—that that's a lot. It's a lot. So th think when you think about what what a thousand—I mean, a thousand megawatts is like—it's like a city. It's like a city going on or off. Um, it's a tremendous amount of power and the ability to have this, uh, on a variable basis relieves enormous cost to those, to those, um, rate payers at the end of the day, because it, all those costs end up getting passed back eventually. Um, and it lowers the stress on the system. It, it reduces the need for peaker plants. So when you think about, you know, ERCOT wakes up in the morning and says, oh shit, there's way more demand than there is supply. They have two options. One is to go call the coal plant operators and say, fire it up, boys. Um, the other is to go out into the open market and to pay a very high price for more power to, to basically import the power into your system um, because the people on the other side of that phone call know you're a forced buyer, and so they're going to take you to the edge of what you could possibly ever you know, pay for that. So um, either way, it's bad, right? And what a curtailable piece of the load means that there's now a thousand megawatts of capacity that don't have to get turned on at, at one of these high demand, you know, whether it's diesel or coal or whatever, whatever the generation source is, um, or it's a thousand megawatts that don't have to get overspent on in the open um, intergrid market and then get ported in. And oh, by the way, you know, if you look at the geography of Texas, where is that power needed? It's needed in Austin and Houston and Dallas, which are Southern. And so you got to move that power really far. And we know from past discussions that when mm -hmm. you move power over a long distance, not all of it shows up. So you've got to overbuy for the power because it's coming from further away. You know, there, there's lots of problems. Introducing a load like this to a system at the level of flexibility and the level of, 
of high frequency response time that Bitcoin miners are able to offer is unprecedented. What have the miners swapped out in the system? Have they swapped out a need for, you know, that demand response power or if they increase the total amount of power being put into the system and then so that's a tricky question okay um when new generation gets put into a grid that's a multi-year planning process because you've got to manage the where that power is located what are the zones what's the infrastructure what's the transmission all the different um types of upgrade and development uh downstream needs from you know let's just say i build a new a new whatever generation plant. Plugging it in is hard. Getting approval to plug it in is hard. Making sure that it's all gonna work is hard. Um, so that's all kind of proceeding, you know, that along the planning lines that happened in 2017, 18, 19, and 20. That's all kind of chugging along. The Bitcoin miners are a straight up reduction in demand. Right. So it's, it's, like, it's like going to the supermarket and a, the first 100 people who show up in the morning saying, we don't need to shop today. Huh. And how how many miners could you know how much power could the miners take in the system? Like, it, could they get to ten percent? Would that be a good thing? Twenty percent? Um, in Texas, there's probably not enough to go much more than we've already seen. Right. Okay. Because um, right now, I think that you know the demand response hours are probably more valuable than the mining hours during the most congested times. Right. Okay. But there was no situation, say, if those miners weren't there, that the system would have failed. Or is there? Well, it's tricky. So it, I can't say it wouldn't have failed. You know, I, we, didn't, we don't know what would have happened. But, you know, the stress on the system would have been really quite significant. Um, they would have needed to force shutter, you know, rolling br brownouts or blackouts in certain areas or a possibility What's at a that brownout? point. Uh, a brownout is when you lose access to, like, firm power. So a brownout is like a partial shutdown. A blackout is like you've lost access to the transmission line. So a blackout is literally the lights go out and everything goes out. Everything goes out. But a brownout, what does that mean? Intermittent or? Yeah, it's it, it's like it's in um it's like uh insufficiently stable power. Right. And I'm the, sure they're I'm sure they're like you know who's going to DM us after this is going to be Blake. He's going to say, "Well, there's a technical definition." Well, do you know what we say to Blake? You should have come on the fucking show. You had your chance. <laughs> we asked you. You were busy. Can we get him on? Uh. Yeah, I, I can, I like I can Blake. DM him. I like Blake. He's a good guy. Um, I mean, this ERCOT thing's great. It's like super interesting. Do, but do we know of any other grids who are now starting to look at this? Well, California's been struggling for a long time. Okay. I don't think they're uh, as constructive as ERCOT is. I think they've got different problems. I think that, you know, what we're seeing is, you know, how much have you paid attention to what's happened in Germany? A lot. Okay. So... It sucks. It's not good. Mm -hmm. This is kind of the the terminal velocity of a lot of really really bad energy policy. Mm -hmm. um, we are not in the same position as Germany, but we're on the same you know we're on the same roller coaster. You're not building any nuclear reactors. California's haven't they just decommissioned their last one? They're fighting to keep it open. Okay. Has um, Schellenberg had anything to do with that? Because I know he he's a huge advocate. Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a woman who is a great. She's a her title, she's a model, and, and but she's a nuclear influencer. A nuclear influencer. Her tag on Twitter is isodope. <laughs> That's brilliant, <laughs> isodope. And she's she makes like pro nuclear energy education TikToks. Holy shit! We need to go. I'm her following on. it. I think we need to get her on. She's awesome, Isabel Boemicki. I, I can't. She's either Dutch or German, maybe. Yeah. Dan's got a big smile on his face at the moment. I just think it's funny. Yeah. That's all. That's all. <laughs> Don't worry. Your wife doesn't listen to the show. Yeah, she doesn't listen. Um, she's awesome. Yeah. And and I think like, you know, when I – one of the – talk about bipartisan issues. Like mm. to, to me, where we go from here is like there is no – to me, there is no, there is no palatable political position that is not pro-Bitcoin and pro-nuclear power. Yeah, so we're starting to dig into this. We've actually started to dig into this because um, I look across all of this. I want to understand it all. Look, I accept there's a climate issue. I also accept uh, we have a massive issue with not allowing people to generate energy. Like energy is important for humans to flourish. And, I get it. And and the bad that will come from unstable power grids yes. and increasingly volatile access to energy and increasing price. Because let's just keep let be very 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 clear. In Germany right now, it's not only that 
they are being f- that they are starting to have power rationing come to the market. Mm-hmm. They're also paying three times as much for what they're getting. Yeah. So if you told the average American household that your pa- your utility bill is about to triple, give me that nuclear shit. Get Mr. Burns in. How, how transferable is it though? Like to take what they've done at ERCOT and do it elsewhere? Because it's a very, it's like an isolated grid, right, at ERCOT? So, so I don't think, so I think that w- w- it's important that we clarify exactly what you mean, what they've done in ERCOT. The demand response and presence of miners? Yeah, and like, and sort of integrating that with the grid. I, I think that's very achievable everywhere. Okay. Hold on, what is the deal between the grid and the miners? So in Texas, there's some uh, unusual dynamic, there's two, there's two driving forces behind why Texas is an attractive place to mine Bitcoin. Um, based on this sort of grid integration thing that, that's been kind of at the center of a lot of the conversation. Um, the first is that it's a, it is a fully deregulated market. So granular, hour-to-hour, real-time pricing, bid in, bid out. So if I, if, let's just say I've, I buy a, con, a forward contract for one day of power uh, or, or one, you know, one month of power at, at $25 a megawatt hour and then the, the price spikes, I can choose to give that power back and make the difference. I can't do that in New York City. Why? Because it's not a deregulated power market. So there's a, a, a group in the government called FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. They govern all power generation assets everywhere in the U.S. other than ERCOT because it's deregulated. And so the first piece is the, is the ability to interact on a very granular basis with the power. The second is that there's this other thing called uh, demand response. And other grids in the U.S. have demand response programs. The revenue from demand response programs in Texas is just higher, right? There's more volatility. There's more congestion. It has to do with how the state is laid out and the load zones and all this other stuff. But the net net of it is that if you're a miner in Texas and you participate in a demand response program, there's more revenues available to you out of a program like that there than elsewhere. And is that because you get power cheaper, but on the condition that you turn it off at a certain point? You get paid to give the power back. You get paid to give it back. And at the time you give it back, do you get paid more than you get to mine? Sometimes. Yeah. You can. And I guess, does the mine have a choice? Like they have to offer them the... So there's different programs. Right. Sometimes, sometimes you can get put to give the power back. Sometimes it's voluntary. Sometimes it's... It's you need to get back a certain number of hours. There's other it, everything is off the of grabs. It's very complicated. Yeah, but yeah. but there's um, there's a lot of opportunity around intermittent consumption in ERCOT that's more attractive than elsewhere. So back to the nuclear thing, because again we're starting to look at that now. We want to get some people on on nuclear. We want to understand it more. I have people. Okay, give us your people because uh, you know I there was um, Mark Andreessen was on Rogan talking about it as well. Schellenberg has been talking about it. Lots of people are talking about nuclear, and I did some research, and I was trying to understand why people are against nuclear. And look, there are natural super green people who are going to be against this, of course, I get it. They think of nuclear waste, and it scares the shit out of them, and yada, yada. But we've actually gone into the detail. We looked at So just a couple of eye-opening things that uh, at Fukushima, one person died. Mm-hmm. And that's even under dispute. Uh, with um, Chernobyl, what was it, like 26, 32, something? It was something like that, yeah. These aren't great. They're, every death is horrible. And, and there's been these other externalities, like the, the region of Chernobyl is, is a no-go zone. And lots of people got cancers. And things. Again, it's all terrible. But if you actually compare the what the impact of burning coal and what that's that done to the environment and certain lung diseases as well, like let's be realistic. There are consequences and risks of them all. But the benefits, it appears to me, on nuclear far, far outweigh the risks of any burning of a fossil fuel to generate almost unlimited clean power. Yes. Doesn't make any sense. So so let me let me take you back even a further step behind yep. nuclear, which is that this idea in, a, in mo, you know, modern times that we can't have access to as much energy at a very low cost that we want is, is false. We can have as much as we want. We just need the will to invest in it. We need the time and the effort to improve the technology. The technology doesn't need to be improved to get there, but, but th- you know, I think about, you know, w- when you think of the, the sort of the, the, the Moore's Law cycles, right? NVIDIA, when they released their, G- their GPU for the first time in the, in the earlier 2000s, they were releasing a new chip size uh, and software 
every six months. We're on version four of nuclear reactors, 70 years later. It took us 70 years to get to version four. If NVIDIA was doing it, it would have taken them two years. Right, okay. So we're 140 times slower in nuclear than we are in chip. 